Uh, this is part two about dangerous drug claims and defective medical device claims. Greg Krasowski, an attorney. Uh, where we left off, we talked about all the different criteria you needed to meet to have a viable dangerous drug claim. And what I wanted to discuss with you in the second part is, let's say you've taken a drug, regardless of whether it's a generic or a brand name drug, Regardless of whether the side effect, let's say the side effect that you've suffered from, the medical condition, was already in a warning label. But you believe that the physician who prescribed it to you um, failed to properly monitor you. Whatever happened to you could have been prevented had the physician kept an eye out for those particular warning symptoms of your medical condition. Would you be able to have a claim against not just the drug manufacturer, because you may be precluded from suing the drug manufacturer for all the reasons we discussed in part one, but would you have a claim against the medical professional, the physician, physician's assistant, who still has to work under the supervision of a doctor, or nurse practitioner who also has to work under the supervision of a doctor? You may. Medical malpractice claims are extremely difficult to prosecute, and those are handled by local attorneys who specialize in medical malpractice. So if you're calling me from outside of the District of Columbia, uh, my involvement would be working as co-counsel with a local medical malpractice attorney. Uh, if you find one who would be willing to take on your case because they believe you have a viable claim. Um, how, so what are we talking about? Let's look at some examples. For instance, people call us for blood thinner drugs, where Lovenox, one of them, where obviously anytime you take a blood thinner, uh, there's a risk of internal hemorrhaging, internal bleeding. But there are cases where people are given shots with maybe excessive dosages, or too often, too frequently, and they start developing warning signs, or not just warning signs, but clear and definitive signs of internal bleeding. But the medical personnel that are monitoring the patient, either within the facility, uh, if a patient is hospitalized, or monitoring someone who's coming into a doctor's office for a checkup, don't pick up on it, continue administering Lovenox, till the bleeding can cause severe damage, if not death internal bleeding. Um, how would you be able to prosecute a medical malpractice case like this? Again, you would need extensive review of medical records. Uh, first, you have to get all the medical records from all the relevant parties, including the pharmaceutical records, to see exactly you know, how much was dispensed of a particular drug. Um, then you would need medical experts who would evaluate these records and agree that the local medical team that treated you, treated the patient, uh, did not meet generally accepted local standards of care. So you have a standard of medical care that every physician is expected to meet. Obviously, they can't be negligent, they can't be uh, reckless in their medical treatment of you. They have to abide by these particular local standards, generally accepted local standards. Uh, why am I emphasizing the word local? Because it's so one thing if you're being treated in Manhattan or in some other major urban area with leading medical centers, where you have leading clinicians, leading researchers. It's another thing if you're being treated in some rural county where there may be a shortage of physicians, shortage of even of physicians, assistants, or nurses. Um, the standards there, the local standards there, obviously are not going to be as high as you're going to, you know, it's like, you have different standards for different types of physicians. There's one standard for a guy, for a doctor who's been practicing for 40 years and maybe a Nobel Prize award, and another standard for someone who just finished his residency out of medical school. So, you know, but that's a bit of a silly comparison. Um, the other issue that comes up, uh, and this, this is going back to part one of the video, well, we've got a case where you were given a particular drug, where you had a particular medical device installed or prescribed to you, 
and the doctor didn't go through all those warnings. You didn't get your fully informed consent. And now you say, well, wait a minute, you know, I've suffered injuries. I didn't, I don't believe I was adequately warned. I can't sue the pharmacist. He did his part, you know, he gave you the pill bottle in the paper bag with the label stapled to it. And, uh, buyer beware, right? Caveat emptor. Uh, can't sue the drug manufacturer because the warnings are on their warning label, or I took a generic. Uh, but what about the physician? Well, if you believe that the physician did something wrong, one of the things you may consider doing, and, and by the way, uh, since this really has to do with the law of your state, and certain regulations of your particular state. So you, you should consult with a local lawyer on this. Uh, but you do have the option of filing a complaint with your state medical board. That's the board that licenses and supervises physicians uh, and other medical uh, professionals like physicians, assistants, nurses. Often they'll have separate boards for each particular license category. Uh, but the point is, you know, if you have a complaint about your doctor or your nurse practitioner or your physician's assistant because you believe they committed medical malpractice or in their treatment they didn't meet these generally accepted local standards of care or standards of care that are established by your state's medical board, because they're the ultimate authority within your state and how people should be treated, you can file a complaint. You can always get that phone number, just Google it, you know, your state's medical board. They'll send you a form, or a form is available for download online. You fill it out. You submit an launch an investigation. Um, we'll see what the outcome of the investigation is. Sometimes people say, well, you know, it's like filing complaints against the police. Sure, every police department has internal affairs, but uh, those, department, those units are also st staffed by police officers who are going to protect their own. And maybe you have the same situation with physicians, nurses, or physicians' assistants, that the medical boards are going to give leeway uh, to their medical profession. So that's something you need to consider. The other uh, thing that I recommend to everyone is if you've suffered from a dangerous drug, uh, or if you've suffered a side effect that you believe uh, people need to be aware of, uh, or from a defective medical device, definitely report this to the FDA. Uh, the FDA has a special hotline, they have a section on their website where people can report adverse events, you know, it's called an adverse event basically, uh, and they'll send you a form to fill out, they'll send a form for your physician to fill out, because it's important to know those statistics. Often those statistics can have a, uh, a significant part or influence the FDA's decision of asking the drug manufacturer to update their warning label or to add that, black, add that black box warning. So it's important that these statistics uh, don't kind of, you know, fall by the wayside unnoticed, but are properly recorded. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, we've talked about state medical boards. We've talked about a physician's duty to give you, you know, get your fully informed consent before giving you prescription drug treatment or giving you a medical device. Uh, we've talked about all the issues. By the way, uh, speaking of defective medical device, another issue that comes up, and I think we'll probably handle this at length in another video, uh, pre-market approval. Number of medical devices that have later on been determined to be defective or dangerous or have caused serious injuries, uh, were released on the market under a particular procedure called pre-market approval. Now it's almost like getting a device as part of a clinical test, except, you know, you're the guinea pig, and, that, and that's horrific. Uh, but it happens, and there's a reason for that, you know, because certain devices, once the drug manufacturer has demonstrated to the FDA through studies that they do on their own, there's an issue of how those studies are monitored, vetted, and financed, whether they're really objective and thorough enough, uh, but you know, once the drug manufacturer or the medical device manufacturer has gone through that, um, we believe that it's, when I say we, you know, the, the current FDA regime believes that it makes sense to put these devices on the market. Uh, 
Uh, otherwise, you can wait forever while people who need that particular medical device are you know, left out in the cold. Just like you'll have expedited drug approval for you know, cancer drugs or HIV drugs, AIDS drugs, things like that. Um, so if you've suffered from a defective medical product, medical device that, that went, went on the market through this pre-market approval process that may add cred credence to your claim. Speaking of lobbying, this is the last part. Um, here's what I need all of you to understand. Uh, you know, if you're a layperson, if you don't have any medical background or medical experience, obviously you're going to be relying on what your doctor is going to tell you in terms of the drug you should take with a medical device that should be used on you or, or implanted in you. Uh, you're going to rely on the FDA to do their job as the government regulator and make sure that we have safe devices and safe drugs on the market. Uh, but your physician, your medical professional, and your government regulator are vulnerable to industry lobbying. And millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, probably billions over the years, have been spent on lobbying. So what does that do? Well, look at your typical doctor's office. You'll see the drug company sales reps come in all the time. They'll give the staff, you know, calendars, trinkets, pens. That's harmless. Thing. They're probably useful, right? Especially if you as a patient get some too. They'll also give uh, doctors free samples to give out to patients, you know. To get you kind of hooked, if that's the term. Um, they also deliver catered breakfasts, lunches to the doctor's offices. And obviously the office staff looks forward to that because you're getting a free lunch. And then they give presentations to doctors. So you'll have a sales rep who's not a doctor, who is not a pharmacologist. They may not have any medical background. They may not even be a nurse or nurse's aide or anything, but... They're sales reps, so they, they tell the doctor, well, this is what we have on the drug pamphlet. We have all these experts. Here's the video. This is the good stuff you should prescribe to your patient. And the doctor does. Or they'll also give out free samples. And the patients who are having you know, prescription drug coverage issues will appreciate those free samples. And some doctor's offices, especially the busy ones, will have hundreds of thousands of dollars of free samples in the office. Uh, then the drug manufacturer will get a report from the pharmacy about uh, how much was prescribed of a particular drug by a particular physician in their you know coverage area because they all have their, their little territories that they market. Um, so they look at the report. They go, "Okay, Doctor Johnson. Wow, she prescribed. She's like one of the leading prescribers of this drug." Well, this surgeon is really, you know, he's, he's really implanting a lot of these medical devices. We should invite him to a rich corporate seminar. And there'll be a nice seminar at some fancy resort, golf club, wherever else, fully paid for, free room and board, food. And the whole goal is, you know, this is a setting where the drug manufacturer Basically, it gets to do some more propaganda on the doctors about how good the drug is. And so they go there, and it's almost like bribery, right? You, you've gotten a free retreat. Why? Because you're one of the leading prescribers of a drug or leading user or implanter of a medical device. Uh, I guess installer, you could even say that. Uh, what happens then? Well, you know, if you're really high up, they'll say, wow, you must really appreciate our drug. You know, maybe, and you must really understand it. So, Dr. Johnson, maybe at the next retreat, uh, we would like you to give a speech or, you know, read a report to the physician. So we'll pay you a consulting fee for that. So not only do you get to go to some fancy place, and I remember I was at a Lawyers Catholic convention in Cancun, and I met some physicians who were there, fully paid trip by drug manufacturers. Pretty nice I get to go to Cancun because you've prescribed a lot of a, of a drug. 
and this included uh, pediatricians. You know, these are doctors who are prescribing drugs to children, our children. That's scary. Uh, so, if you're the you know the guest speaker, you also get speaking fees. You know, obviously not like you know the speaking fees we heard about during the last election with a certain candidates getting hundred thousand dollars speaking fees from investment banks, but. And they've had lawsuits. They've actually had prosecutions uh, of some cases for some drugs. Because the other issue that comes up is uh, if the drugs are not prescribed for a particular condition that they were explicitly approved for, right? Kind of what they call off-label prescriptions. So you'll have a drug that's approved to treat high blood pressure or would you treat a particular type of seizure. Now it's also being prescribed to treat migraine headaches and things like that. And, it's off-label use, and not only can this cause injury to patients, but it can also defraud medical insurance companies, uh, especially Medicare and Medicaid, who are paying for prescription drugs that are not necessarily the appropriate drugs to be prescribed for their medical condition. Uh, but it's just simply a way of increasing revenues. You know, if you can have a drug being used for all sorts of stuff, then you just make more money. Um, so with all these issues, what do you need to keep in mind? Basically, your physician's independence or objectivity is probably compromised. If it's compromised, what does that mean to you as the patient who expects their doctor to be their gatekeeper? Well, it means that you're going to have to do your homework. Uh, no matter what your profession is, no matter what your educational background is, if you have access to a library, if you have access to the internet, uh, go online, you know, do the research, buy the medical book. You know, remember the pill book we used to sell before that would give you photos of all the different pills, generic names, brand names, list of symptoms of conditions that a drug is prescribed for. Do your own research. And before you take anything that's been prescribed to you, before you agree to take it, before you agree to pay money to the pharmacy. Now you go to the pharmacy with a prescription. Now let's say that prescription is now electronically transmitted to your pharmacy. Before they start getting that prescription ready for you, say, wait a minute, can you first show me the warning label? Ask the pharmacist if your doctor's uh, staff or the doctor himself or herself are too busy. And, and go through all these things and look on the internet, look, look at stories people publish on the internet to see whether you could become the victim of that particular side effect. That's the smart way to go about it. The obvious smart way to go about it, and I tell this to everyone that I have the opportunity to talk to, is your number one medicine should be what? Your food. That's another quote by Hippocrates, by the way, which means healthy food. That's a good way to treat things. Um, so, brand name or generic drug, Make sure you get your pharmaceutical printout. See whether the symptom that you've suffered from or the condition has been caused by the particular drug or medical device. Whether that symptom uh, was disclosed on the warning label. If you meet all these criteria and you think you may have a viable claim because the, the condition wasn't adequately and accurately disclosed because we know there's already scientific and statistical evidence, uh, then you've got a shot against the drug manufacturer or the medical device manufacturer. If not, if you think you have a case of potential medical malpractice, then that, that something's gonna be handled primarily by your local medical malpractice attorney. Or if you believe that you want this thing investigated first, then you always have the right as a patient to have your state medical board look into something. But one thing I would strongly discourage and advise against, like any lawyer, is frivolous or false complaints. Just because you're not happy with what happened to you doesn't mean that you should be filing complaints against your medical professional, especially if the complaints aren't well-grounded or well-based and may be frivolous, right, or just simply vindictive. Uh, that's an abusive process because these complaints take up resources, they cause stress, and you should never make, you know, it's, it's like slander and libel making false accusations against people, bad news, and you shouldn't do it. And also reporting any particular side effects for statistics, for statistical pur purposes to the FDA. But here's what I want to leave you with. 
even if you can't get compensation for yourself, try to get justice for yourself and try to get justice for other people. And one way we can get justice for people is if state medical boards and medical schools uh, start teaching doctors to take the five minutes before they prescribe anything to you to go over with you all the pros and cons, all the potential benefits, and all the potential complications, negative adverse side effects. If that had happened, boy, I'd, I'd be happy to you know shut down my dangerous drug practice or effective medical device practice. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it can if enough of us voice our complaints, voice these demands to state medical boards or even to our legislators. And speaking of legislators, I've already told you how your physician's objectivity and independence is compromised by all the drug company lobbying and the sales reps. Same thing happens with state legislatures, with governors, with Congress, with Senate and with agencies within the executive branch where our federal government like the FDA. There's a lot of lobbying that's directed at these structures and the people within them from both the medical industry who want to minimize their liability and from the drug industry that want to minimize their legal and financial liabilities as well. So, plus, you know, if you keep track of DC, you'll realize there's a revolving door. And the revolving door is very simple. People will go work for a government agency like the FDA. And they're already looking to get a job in the private sector. And often at companies that their agency regulates. So you go into the private sector for higher pay. Um, you know, you're still in touch with the buddies that you work with at your federal agency. Now you're handling proper relations with that federal agency. With all that inside knowledge that you have. And perhaps relationships, right? Um, and then if we look at how heads of government agencies are appointed, they're political appointees, right? They're going to be appointed by whoever is the governor or whoever is the president. And these appointments are political appointments. So they take people from the industry that the gov that, that government regulatory agency is monitoring, and they make them managers of that agency. Now, it's like the fox guarding the chicken coop, right? The fox gets appointed to be the security guard for the chicken coop, right? Um, so their independence, their loyalty may be compromised. Their loyalty now, loyalty now is to their industry, to their former employers. Most of these guys know that once their political appointments are over with, you know, come next election cycle or whoever, you know, whatever other party comes into power, they're gonna go right back, chances are, to their former employer, another employer in the industry, even for more pay. So no one's rocking the boat, you know. No, no one's gonna jeopardize their future job uh, opportunities because they're protecting the public, right? The public isn't getting these people money. Uh, although we as taxpayers do pay their salaries, but they don't look at it that way. They're, they're looking at it in a different way. So people say, you know, should I write a letter to my state senator, state rep? Uh, congressman, senator, sure you could. You can also write the letters to the heads of the FDA. You can write a letter to uh, the president. It's not going to get you far. Uh, it'll, hopefully you'll get an answer. But uh, it really takes a mass grassroots roots effort to try to get some change. Uh, what's the other part of line of defense for you? Obviously, it's the court system, the judicial branch. And my opinion is... Uh, there's some lobbying going on there too. As you know, you're either going to be, if you're going to be, if you're running for a judicial office, right, for a judgeship, you're going to be nominated either by the Democratic or the Republic Party in your state, in your county, in your city. Uh, and if that's, or the federal bench, same thing. Federal judges are appointed by the president, but the nominations are from their state senators, things like that two-party system so if you're a lawyer if you're a loyal party guy it's going to be easier for you to be a judge and if you're a pro-business judge you know, we've seen that we've seen a lot of judges who take pro-business positions maybe that's why we have some of these judicial decisions that have 
severely hampered or limited the opportunities for patients to sue drug companies, to sue medical device manufacturers, and to sue uh, medical professionals and uh, medical facilities like hospitals, medical centers. So what you really have to rely on is, you know, if you don't expect the judiciary to save you. Don't expect the, uh, the executive or the legislative branch to save you, right? Don't expect the FDA or your medical professionals to save you. What's the expression, right? The duty for, for someone who's sinking, right? Someone who's drowning, uh, the obligation is for themselves to try to save themselves. Don't just think that the lifeguard is going to save you magically, right? This isn't Baywatch. Um, if you've suffered from a dangerous drug or defective medical device, I'd love to help you out, but I can only help you along with my colleagues uh, within current law. Uh, and within the constraints that we operate, I, I'd love to spend my whole day talking to people who call my office, but since they're not paying for the phone calls, I'd go broke and I wouldn't be able to feed my family. I'd love to be able to evaluate people's medical records with my limited medical background, right? In EMS, uh, and, and doing some, you know, laboratory research in neuropharmacology, but same thing, right? I can't do that for everyone. Um, so we only look at viable claims. Uh, hopefully this video has helped. Uh, if you filed a complaint with your state medical board and you've gotten a positive response, let us know about it. I'd like to keep track of those statistics. Uh, if you've succeeded in a medical, local medical malpractice case for a medical professional who failed to properly monitor a drug or a medical device, uh, who who didn't properly prescribe it to you or implant it or install it, let us know as well. Uh, and uh, wish you the best of luck. Mm -hmm.